Can you imagine running 30 milligrams of halotestin per day for up to two years? I mean, I think your liver would melt. Your liver would probably melt right into your testicles. And now all of these amino acids are available for your testicles to continue to produce semen. Right, man, my liver is just hurting thinking about it. You know, there's not enough tutka in the world to mitigate all of the side effects of this much halo testing. Vigor, Steve, here in this video, we're going to discuss anabolic androgenic steroids versus male fertility. I looked at all of the scientific evidence so you don't have to. I found 169 studies about male fertility in the context of using anabolic androgenic steroids, but I only looked at the testosterone derivatives, the dihydrotestosterone derivatives, the 90 nor testosterone, the nandrolone derivatives. I'm going to save all of the studies performed on exogenous testosterone for testosterone replacement therapy, for example, for another video titled TRT versus fertility, because there's thousands of studies performed in that context. And for this video, I probably looked at approximately a thousand studies as well. I found 169 studies which are applicable to the context of this video. So before we get into it, please like the video, leave a comment for the algorithm, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you want to vote for the upcoming deep dives or join the weekly vigorous Q&A, which is always on Saturday, consider joining the YouTube or Patreon memberships. Okay, so for this video, I'm just going to focus on the testosterone derivatives, which we all come to know and love for overall bodybuilding and fitness aspirations. Steroids are, of course, very good for muscular development, but deleterious for fertility and overall semen parameters. Or are they? I actually found a couple of anabolic androgenic steroids which might be beneficial in the context of fertility if you're currently subfertile, perhaps after a steroid cycle. So stay tuned. We're going to discuss all of that. And I use the following search parameters on PubMed, PubMed Central, ResearchGate, Science Direct, as well as Google Scholar. I combined the generic steroid name or its chemical name or the various brand names, if they are available, with testes or testicles, sperm, semen, spermatosa, fertility, reproduction, as well as Leydig cells or Sertoli cells to really get an accurate indication of how these particular steroids affect the reproductive system of males. I look for adult men over 19 years old in various stages of health, ranging from completely infertile or subfertile, where the semen parameters fall below the reference ranges established by the World Health Organization in 2021, as well as completely normal, fertile men in good states of health. I excluded the females, even though I did find some scientific evidence on how a particular anabolic energetic steroids affect fertility in women. So long story short, steroids in the context of female pregnancy, that's a terrible idea, whether they actually prevent pregnancy from occurring or induce abortions during later stages of pregnancy. Ladies, if you're thinking about conceiving in the near future, stay away from steroids. And the same could be said for men thinking about taking steroids in the near future. If you're thinking about conceiving, just stay clear. For this video, I didn't include the non-translated studies, whether those were in German or Russian, Italian, Japanese, unless a translated abstract was available with enough information to draw a substantial conclusion from. So I would say, considering the entire body of knowledge regarding steroids or testosterone derivatives and their overall effect on fertility parameters, whether that's in humans or animals, I would say that this video includes approximately 90 to 95% of everything that's currently available. I classified the studies into positive effects, so fertility parameters would improve, whether that's in human or animal models, a neutral effect, so maybe during the steroid treatment, fertility parameters actually went down or worsened, but there's some sort of way to mitigate that. Or after discontinuation, fertility parameters returned to baseline before steroid treatment. And then there's negative studies, of course, where overall fertility parameters, semen parameters went down significantly. So the main difference between a neutral and negative study is in most cases the matter of a follow-up or a longer study duration. You can find all of the references down below in the YouTube description section. I might have to put them on a document and share that on Dropbox or something so you can get all of the scientific literature down there. I summarized all of the scientific evidence into a short sentence so you know exactly what it's about. And I classified them into positive human studies, neutral human studies, negative human studies, positive animal studies, neutral animal studies, and negative animal studies. 
Let's look at the results. I'll put them on the screen right now so you can follow it along. Of all of the studies which are performed on anabolic androgen steroids in general, in most cases, these are observational studies. I didn't look at the animal studies because there's simply too many of them, but I did look at the human studies in this context. Steroids in general, of the 25 studies I could find on human subjects, 16 have a negative result and nine have a neutral result with none of them resulting in a positive outcome regarding fertility parameters. Keep in mind that all of these studies have been performed on steroids in combination, steroid cycles, or looking at steroids as a whole, only neutral or negative outcomes when it comes to human subjects. So let's look at each steroid when they're studied individually. This is just an overview, guys, so you have it right in front of you. We'll get more into depth a little bit later into this video. Of the 12 studies performed on boldenone, there are 11 negative animal studies. Of Terinabol, only one negative human study. One testosterone dihydroboldenone, I couldn't find any studies out there that showed its effects on overall fertility parameters. Drostanolone, Mastrone, there's only one study which has a negative effect in animal models. Halotestin, now we get to the interesting results. Of the 16 studies performed, over half of the results show a positive effect in human models. I mean, who would have known that halotestin, the most aggravating steroid out of all of them, can actually improve fertility parameters? And it's the same case with Provirin. I found 35 studies performed on humans and animals, and 18 human studies show a positive outcome. That's over half of all of the studies that's available. Half of that show a neutral result, and half of that, four studies, show a negative result. So doesn't mean that Proviron is completely in the green. There's still four studies which show a negative result. The same can be said for halotestin, but the large majority of the studies performed in humans for halotestin and Proviron, for that matter, show a positive outcome in subfertile men. Keep in mind that these studies were performed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s at the latest. And after that, there have been no follow-up studies regarding its positive effect on fertility parameters because selective estrogen receptor modulators came to market around the same time. So I feel that the medical community now favors uh, enclomiphene, clomid, nolvidex, or other serms for fertility purposes over halotestin or provirin. Still, interesting results. We'll get more into depth a little bit later. Of the single study that has been performed on primabolin, there's one negative animal model. The animal of the limited scientific evidence that we have the large majority show a negative result in both human studies and animal models. I couldn't find anything on Superdrol regarding its effects on overall fertility parameters. Metribolone, also very limited, also a negative result on human and animal studies. I couldn't find anything on check drops. There's a lot of scientific evidence regarding female dogs and its impairing effects on fertility on female dogs, but we're looking for male animals or male humans. So regarding male fertility parameters, there's nothing to see here. Nandrolone, of the 26 studies that I was able to find, the large majority show a negative result, both in human studies and animal models. And actually the animal models comprises over half of the studies that I was able to find. Oxandrolone, Anivar, I was only able to find three studies. One study of the humans falls into a neutral result. We'll discuss that a little bit later and the others fall into a negative result regarding the animal models. Anadrol, both negative and neutral results in animal models, but nothing on human subjects. We'll save the testosterone for another video, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not subscribed yet, now's a good time to do so, so you can get it right when it drops. Trestolone, a very compelling body of knowledge regarding its negative effects in human subjects. I mean, Trestolone meant was designed as a male contraceptive, but in most cases, complete azospermia was not established. And there's also neutral and negative results in animal models. Trembolone, I'm honestly a little bit disappointed that I couldn't find any more scientific evidence regarding Trembolone's effect on fertility parameters, because, well, Trembolone at one point or another was approved for human use in particular medical conditions, but I was only able to find one single study performed on humans with a negative outcome, and the rest show a neutral or negative outcome in animal models. I couldn't find anything on Stenbalone, and the large majority of the studies performed on Winstrol show a negative effect in animal models. So that's 169 studies that I reviewed for you guys, not as scrutinously 
is the studies that I reviewed for the Boldenone versus Kidney Health video series. Still, we'll have to take all of this at face value because otherwise we'll be researching these studies until the end of time, basically until he death, and nobody has time for that. But when you look at this body of knowledge and this little summary of the studies that I was able to find for you guys, besides halotestin and proviron, everything pretty much falls into the red. Okay, let's look into the studies a little bit more in depth and start reviewing them together. It won't exactly be a deep dive like previous videos, but trust me, it'll be deep enough for impregnation leading into conception later on. And if you're a researcher and you're going to use my material, which I link down below for your own research purposes, because again, there's not a single study out there that has this many references in regards to steroids versus fertility. And it might even be double that after we finished the TRT versus fertility video. Let's say I'll have 350 references by the time we're done with this subject. So if you use all of my material for research purposes, I expect to be credited and make sure that your study actually passes the peer review process and gets published. An honorable mention in the acknowledgements is highly appreciated. So I can find my own name on PubMed too. Okay, let's go into the general anabolic energetic steroids with regards to human male fertility. Of the 10 neutral studies that I was able to find, most of the neutral studies show that there's a partial or full recovery of the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis, as well as spermatogenesis. Various fertility parameters improve within one year of steroid discontinuation. Although in some case reports, it might take up to three years for HPTA function to fully recover and spermatogenesis to restore to fertile levels. In some instances, in clomiphene or HCG or HMG or recombinant FSAs are used to sustain fertility during testosterone replacement therapy or anabolic energetic steroid exposure or after full discontinuation, these fertility medications are used to recover HPTA and spermatogenesis to the point conception is actually possible again and pregnancies are actually achieved. There's a randomized phase two clinical trial showing that in clomiphene on TRT actually sustains LH and FSH concentrations as well as fertility parameters. An observational study showed recovery of normal spermatogenesis after 6.35 months of steroid discontinuation. Another observational study, the highly criticized Harlem study, showed recovery of normal spermatogenesis within one year of steroid discontinuation. Now, a couple points for the men who actually performed this Harlem study because I heard that some of the participants after this Harlem study was wrapped up and finished, some of them actually got TRT prescribed. So a couple points for the guys that actually performed the study, even though there was a lot of room for improvements regarding the functioning of post psychotherapy medications. And there's a literature review paper showing that most cases of anabolic energy and steroid induced oligospermia or azospermia are likely to resolve themselves spontaneously within four to 12 months of steroid discontinuation. And the same can be said for most case reports, recovery of minimally desired or normal spermatogenesis within several months of steroid discontinuation, which seems to get better with the use of HCG, recombinant FSH, or maybe even HMG or enclomiphene, right? There's a lot of different studies which document that steroid discontinuation eventually leads to an improvement of overall fertility parameters, whether you use fertility medications or not. So for us, for you, me, and everybody else in our hormone space, our bodybuilding space, or our overall fitness space, there's hope if you want to start conceiving in the near future. All you have to do is stop using steroids and use some fertility medications, and fingers crossed, everything will be well within several months of treatment. Now, of course, there are a lot of human studies showing a negative outcome regarding fertility parameters after steroid exposure, but that's because there was no follow-up performed as seen in the neutral human studies. So that means that these studies were performed in a much shorter window of time. And all of these negative human studies show various levels of impaired fertility parameters amongst steroid users. It's very common for complete azospermia to occur, but it isn't always induced by chronic anabolic energetic steroid exposure. Now, morphology and motility are generally far below the reference range for semen parameters established by the World Health Organization in 2010 as well as 2021. And there's even one research paper that showed a correlation between steroid exposure and latex cell cancer. But I think it's better if I save this study for a separate video. Let me know down below 
if you would like to see me poke all kinds of holes into the study and see or determine if steroids can actually induce Leydig cell cancer or not. Maybe we can just poke a little bit of holes into the cancer cells so we can go about our business worry-free. There are several observational studies showing various levels of impaired fertility amongst bodybuilders or other athletes using various combinations of anabolic androgenic steroids. And there are several research papers discussing various applications of androgens as anti-contraceptives. More research papers discussing the correlation between steroid abuse and male infertility. A study showing that exogenous androgens as well as selective androgen receptor modulators impair male fertility parameters but don't always induce complete azoospermia. Testicular atrophy, testicular fibrosis, arrested spermatogenesis in anabolic androgenic steroid using athletes who suddenly passed away. So this is all determined post-mortem. And then, of course, the research paper which shows the correlation between steroids and Leydig cell cancer. So all in all, it doesn't look good. But again, there's no follow-ups in these negative human studies. So I'm just going to go with the neutral human studies showing that after steroid discontinuation within several months of the use of various fertility medications that fertility parameters recover to baseline levels or at least come back to sufficient levels where conception is possible and pregnancies can actually occur. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. I stopped all of the steroids and I went on HCG and HMG switching into recombinant FSH a little bit later in this month for my fertility parameters to come back to sufficient levels for normal conception, right? And hopefully resulting into a pregnancy later in this year. Stay tuned for that news dropping whenever we're ready to release that information to the public. Let's move over to the anabolic energetic steroids and discuss them when examined separately, starting with boldenone, equipoise, there's a single neutral animal study showing that vitamin C co-administration during boldenone and desinate treatment can actually recover partially boldenone induced oxidative stress and dysfunction of the reproductive organs in male rats. And this study was performed by Bahadi et al. in Egypt, the same team of researchers which showed that vitamin C co-administration prevented hepatorenal impairment and oxidative damage in boldenone and desinate treated rabbits. The study that I used previously in the boldenone versus kidney deep dive video showing that vitamin C is essential if you want to prevent damage to your kidneys while using boldenone. So Behari is doing God's work. It shows that vitamin C can actually prevent oxidative damage in the kidneys as well as in the testicles, the reproductive organs of various animals when using boldenone and destinate. So Behari, big up to you. Now we know that vitamin C co-administration is essential when using boldenone because now there's two studies proving that. And there are actually more studies showing that vitamin C co-administration can mitigate some of the oxidative damage occurring within the reproductive organs while using various anabolic androgenic steroids. So vitamin C almost, well, pretty much mandatory. And there are 11 animal models showing a negative outcome with varied levels of impaired fertility parameters amongst animals treated with boldenone and desinate. However, complete azoospermia wasn't always established. Now, this is pretty much the same results for all of the negative animal models. So I'm not going to repeat it for all of the anabolic androgenic steroids, which are going to follow boldenone. A negative outcome means impaired fertility parameters, but maybe not always complete azoospermia, right? I don't have to repeat that another 15 times for the steroids that are going to follow. Let's move over to Terrenable, a single negative human study, a case report of a 32-year-old man who developed intratesticular leiomyosarcoma, which is cancer or tumor within the testicles after five years, five years of chronic usage of high-dose oral Terrenable. Don't do what this guy did, otherwise you will actually get testicular cancer. Now, that's pretty much it for Terrinabol, so let's move over to Masterone. Again, a single negative animal study showing that a group of male Wister rats received nandrolone, methanolone, which is primabolin, and drostanolone. Masterone showed reduced Leydig and Sertoli cells within the testicles. Spermatosa were scarred, and the overall damage of the testicles was tremendous. There's unfortunately no drostanolone studies showing where the steroid was examined individually. So this study will actually show up two more times in the nandrolone segment as well as in the primabolin segment. 
So if you want to use Mastrone, don't do that in combination with Nandrolone or Primabolin because that's deleterious for reproductive function, right? Shown in this single animal study. Let's move over to halotestin, which somehow, some way, apparently can improve semen parameters in subfertile men. But let's look into the insert first, produced in 2006 by Upjohn. That's the most recent insert I could find. The insert says that impairment of fertility was not tested directly in animal species, which is true. I couldn't find a single animal model which shows that halotestin has a beneficial or negative effect on fertility parameters. However, as noted below under adverse reactions, oligospermia in males and anuremia in females are potential adverse effects of treatments with halotestin tablets. Therefore, impairments of fertility is a possible outcome of treatment with halotestin. So the insert says one thing, but all the scientific literature, nine human studies show a positive outcome in subfertile men. So where are we going to go? Are we going to go with the Upjohn halotestin insert? showing that it's not a good idea to take halotestin, or are we going to go with the studies which were performed up until the late 1980s, early 90s? After which, enclomiphene, clomiphene, and HCG, recombinant FSH, and all these fertility medications became more apparent and more preferred to improve overall fertility parameters. I'm going to go with the insert because it's a lot more recent compared to the studies, and when it comes to scientific evidence, more recent conclusions win, still. Nine studies show a positive outcome. All of these studies were performed up until the early 1990s on subfertile men with various levels of pre-existing multi-causal impaired fertility parameters. Fluoxymestrolone halotestin treatment ranged between 2 mg up to 30 mg daily for up to two years. Can you imagine running 30 mg of halotestin per day? for up to two years. I mean, I think your liver would melt. Your liver would probably melt right into your testicles. And now all of these amino acids are available for your testicles to continue to produce semen. All right, man, my liver is just hurting thinking about it. You know, there's not enough tutka in the world to mitigate all of the side effects of this much halotestin. Why in the world would you prescribe 30 milligrams of halotestin for up to two years? Bro. Again, these are studies performed a very long time ago, and hopefully the medical community has wisened up a little bit. Since then, treatment showed significant improvement of semen parameters and pregnancy outcomes. Really, just look at the scientific evidence. A lot more men got their wives pregnant running halotestin. I mean, the amount of angry sex that took place, I can't even imagine. So that's regarding a positive outcome during halotestin treatment. There are three neutral human studies showing normal spermatogenesis either during halotestin treatment or after discontinuation. There's even one case report showing that 5 milligrams halotestin didn't suppress LH and FSH levels in a 53-year-old man who had both testicles surgically removed. So not the pituitary, right? Just the testicles. So even though the testicles would not be there to respond to LH and FSH during 5 milligrams of halotestin treatment, pituitary function was somehow, some way, sustained. Regarding the two negative human studies, it showed a worsening of sex hormone production and HPTA functioning in already subfertile men, which were otherwise responsive to HCG and luteinizing hormone receptor hormone treatments when they were administered with halotestin. So that's only two studies showing a negative outcome, and that's not even determined on overall semen parameters. That's just on HPTA functioning during halotestin treatment, and that's against nine human studies showing a positive outcome. Man, very, very promising. Again, there's no animal models to go over the outcome regarding halotestin treatment, but there are for proviron. But let's start with the human studies first. There are actually a lot of studies about proviron showing that it can improve male impotence and erectile dysfunction. Also, several studies that show that dosages up to 200 milligrams of proviron per day used for up to 60 days in duration do not reduce serum luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone concentrations. But right, don't get too happy, you naturals out there. Proviron treatment did lower total testosterone and free testosterone concentrations, which is weird because. Proviron, of course, lowers SHBG levels substantially, 
And even though it didn't lower LH and FSH concentrations, total testosterone levels go down so much that free testosterone levels go down significantly as well, even though SHPG levels decline. So don't take 200 milligrams per virin per day in an attempt to free up testosterone a little bit more compared to baseline. If you're drug-free, not using exogenous testosterone, Again, I recommended 6.25 up to 12.5 milligrams per virin per day for people who are otherwise drug-free, excluding the provirin, right? Because it doesn't count. It's not very anabolic. It's only used to reduce SHBG concentrations. Now, all the studies showing improved fertility in infertile or subfertile men were performed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. There are actually two medical inserts available for Bayer provirin and Bayer provironum. The first one from, from 1979, which was around the time that most of these studies were performed in the context of improving fertility in subfertile men. The insert from 1979 says, infertility, oligospermia, and deficient latex cell secretion may be the cause of infertility. With provirin treatment, sperm count can be increased, the quality improved, and furthermore, a higher fructose concentration up to normal values can be achieved. Thus, increasing the chances of procreation. So this is 1979. A follow-up insert of 2007 says, Mestrolone, Provirin, was shown to inhibit spermatogenesis in animals following oral administration. Fertility studies on the effect of sperm cells in humans have not been carried out with Provirin. Bayer is apparently scared for lawsuits, and I don't blame them because Bayer got sued plenty in the past and, and might still get sued a plenty in the future. So one insert says that fertility parameters improves and a more recent insert says that fertility parameters might actually worsen during proviron treatment. However, a whopping 18 human studies showing a positive outcome don't lie. All of these studies were performed on subfertile men with various levels of pre-existing multi-causal impaired fertility parameters. Mestrolone treatment ranged between 25 to 150 milligrams daily, occasionally with clomiphene co-administration for up to one year in duration. And during several months of provirin treatment, subfertile men showed significant improvement in semen parameters as well as pregnancy outcomes. And the pregnancy outcomes were even higher compared to the halotestin-treated subfertile men. Again, a lot of studies you can dive into. You can find all of them down below in the YouTube description section. Most of these studies have similar setups, although the dosages of provirin treatments might range a little bit. There's one study that I want to highlight here. 250 subfertile men improved semen concentration significantly after one year of 100 to 150 milligrams provirin per day, of which 115 men achieved conception during treatment. So that's close to half. A lot of men achieved conception during the treatment of provirin. So again, these are older studies, but the body of evidence is quite compelling. However, there are nine human studies showing a neutral outcome. All of the neutral human studies showed slight improvement of semen parameters in currently subfertile men, although not to the minimally required level established by the World Health Organization of 2010 and 2021. So even though these studies were performed a very long time ago, fertility parameters didn't improve to what we now consider to be over subfertile levels or sufficiently fertile levels. Pregnancies were still achieved in most of these studies, although subfertility classification was sustained during the treatment ranging from 50 to 100 milligrams per virin daily. Occasionally, multivitamins or tamoxifen or even blood pressure medications were co-administered for up to one year. So maybe it's in the dose, right? The duration of treatment is the same, one year in the neutral human studies versus the positive human studies. But the positive human studies, the dosages ranged up to 150 milligrams daily in the neutral human studies, only up to 100 milligrams per day. Maybe that is something we can draw a conclusion from. Again, I'll leave it up to you because I don't think it's a good idea to start supplementing with Provirin. If you want to get your wife pregnant, that's not what I'm doing. Nowadays, we use HCG and a recombinant FSH or enclomiphene. And of all of the human studies showing a negative outcome, all five of them, there was no improvement or even a worsening of overall fertility parameters of currently subfertile men using dosages ranging between 50 to 100 milligrams per virin per day for up to six months in duration. 
So again, there's a very large body of evidence showing that provarin treatment in subfertile men can actually improve overall fertility parameters, which is further confirmed by a single animal study showing that provarin improves sperm concentrations by 55.21% in male Worcester rats, one neutral animal study and two negative animal studies. So the overall body of compelling evidence says that provarin is good for your fertility, even more so than halotestin. Still, I would rather stick with HCG, recombinant FSH, and enclomaphene treatments. Moving over to primabolin, which is the exact same study that I mentioned previously in the context of mastrone. So a combination of nandrolone, primabolin, and mastrone is deleterious for testicular function when investigated in male Worcester rats. So let's move over to Dianabol instead. Two negative human studies showing a significant reduction in HPTA function and overall semen parameters. There's a case report that Dianabol suppresses gonadotropin hormone secretion in a male athlete, and fertile men showed a significant reduction in semen parameters after only two months of only 15 milligrams Dianabol per day. But unfortunately, a follow-up fertility investigation was not performed. That was performed in a single animal study, which showed that fertility parameters of pre-pubertal male rats returned to normal, to baseline, after 30 days of a 60-day Dianabol treatment. Now again, pre-pubertal male rats are not very representative of humans, so take this study with a grain of salt. There are five animal studies showing a negative outcome with deleterious effects on the reproductive organs and overall fertility parameters. But I don't have to summarize that. You can kind of assess what's going on based on all of the other results. Superdrol, not investigated in the context of fertility, not in human studies, not in animal models. Now, metribolone has been investigated in animal studies, but mostly to assess androgen receptor presence, content, and binding potential in various tissues and medical conditions. For example, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And there's actually a good amount of studies which investigate the effects that metribolone has on the androgen receptors of the Leydig cells, the Sertoli cells, other testicular cells, as well as prostatic cells. But none of these studies investigate changes in actual fertility parameters. So all we have is a single human study showing a negative outcome that metribolone was unable to improve semen parameters in 15 infertile men with suspected androgen resistance due to androgen receptor abnormalities. Maybe they should have used some halotestin instead. Two negative animal models showing that the metribolone decreases HCG stimulated testosterone production in cultured rat testicular cells, so no tracking of fertility parameters, or metribolone suppresses spermatogenic recovery in irradiated rats, which is not very representative of what um, humans would be willing to subject themselves to. Even if you go into a CT machine or an MRI machine, I don't think that your testicles would be irradiated that much to the point you need metribolone to bring your fertility parameters back. Let's move over to check drops. Again, there's a lot of animal studies showing complete infertility in females, and even in some males, Mibalorone, like metribolone, is used to assess androgen receptor presence, content, and binding potential in various tissues and medical conditions, like androgen insensitivity syndrome, or to assess the response in animal reproductive organs. All studies don't track the changes in overall semen and fertility parameters. So let's just move over to nandrolone, 19 or testosterone, decadurabolin, durabolin, the best steroid we have at our disposal to lubricate our joints and ligaments with. But as the scientific evidence shows, nandrolone is not so good to lubricate your testicles with. There's two human studies showing a neutral outcome with reasonably large sample sizes showing that fertility parameters restored to baseline within 17 months. 17 months, that's how long it took. After 200 milligrams nandrolone weekly discontinuation. These studies indicate that a full HPTA and spermatogenesis recovery might take close to one and a half years after nandrolone treatment, which is actually very similar to nandrolone decanoate's detection time of 18 months. But the major downside of both of these studies is that medroxyprogesterone acetate was co-administered during nandrolone treatment. Medroxyprogesterone acetate is an anti-contraceptive medication with a 40 to 60 hour half-life or an 8.3 
the 12.5 day active life. So even though Nandrol and Decanoate has a much longer active life, medroxybogesterone acetate was co-administered during the time of treatment. Keep in mind that overall semen parameters recovered to normal levels comparable to baseline within 17 months of nandrol discontinuation. And by that time, medroxyprogesterone acetate has long since been metabolized. Still, I have to mention that to you guys so you know exactly how these studies were performed. Four human studies show a negative outcome and all of them showed complete, 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 complete azospermia after nandrol treatments. Semen parameters recovered to subfertile levels in most subjects within six months of discontinuation. So maybe if these subjects waited a little bit longer, let's say 17 months after discontinuation, maybe fertility parameters would recover back to baseline levels. So for all of you nandrolone-only addicts out there, I think there's hope. If you discontinue nandrolone, wait one and a half years and you should be able to start conceiving. Now, before we move on, there's some very interesting results in the animal study showing a neutral outcome during nandrolone treatment because co-administration of artichoke leaf extract, taurine, or even melatonin supplements significantly alleviated nandrolone decanoate-induced pathological alterations, testicular dysfunctioning, worsening of fertility parameters, and even DNA fragmentation in various male Wister rat models. These supplements mitigate nandrolone-induced oxidative stress in the reproductive organs. So besides vitamin C shown in the boldenone animal studies, artichoke leaf extract, taurine, and melatonin supplementation are almost essential or at least beneficial to mitigate the oxidative stress which is induced by steroids, or at least in this case, nandrolone and boldenone. Now again, vitamin C and melatonin have been extensively investigated regarding male fertility and its overall beneficial effects on the reproductive organs. So another point for vitamin C and one point for melatonin. So personally, I would advise everybody out there to start supplementing with those if you care about your fertility in the short term and in the long term. And then there's 14 animal studies showing a negative outcome. All of them showed significant impaired semen parameters DNA fragmentation, histological changes of the reproductive organs, and severe oxidative stress during and even after nandrolone treatment. So the you know the most compelling evidence shows a negative outcome when you're using nandrolone, even though in human subjects with um, a long enough waiting period, fertility parameters might, fingers crossed, might recover to baseline. All right, let's discuss Anivar next, which is mostly examined in the context of the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis and growth hormone axis in boys with a delay of growth in puberty or suffering from Klinefelter syndrome, which is where the DNA contains an extra X chromosome, or pubertal girls with Turner syndrome, where the DNA contains only the X chromosome, but not the Y chromosome. None of these adolescents are of legal reproductive age, and even though sometimes fertility parameters are somewhat investigated in the context of anivar exposure, I didn't include them in this video because, again, legal productive age is what we're after. So there's only a single human study showing a neutral outcome, and this study is a little bit niche, I would say. It's a case report where an HIV-positive man with complete azospermia, after using 100 mg testosterone inotate weekly and 20 mg anivar daily, which is most likely prescribed to prevent muscle wasting during uh, being HIV positive, he achieved conception with, it, with his HIV negative wife during the second in vitro fertilization attempt after three months of steroid discontinuation. During this time, semen parameters improved sufficiently to the point in vitro fertilization was possible. The baby remained HIV negative throughout the third trimester of pregnancy. And after that, there's no additional data in this study. So a single study performed on an HIV positive man showed that after testosterone and anivar discontinuation, he was able to conceive through in vitro fertilization. Again, it's a very unique circumstance, but I wanted to mention it nonetheless. And then there are two animal studies showing a negative outcome regarding oxandrolone and its effect on fertility parameters. But 
co-administration of metformin with oxandrolone significantly relieved toxicological alterations but didn't improve semen parameters significantly in male rats. Without the metformin, male rats induced severe histological changes of the reproductive system and complete arrested spermatogenesis during anivar treatments. So maybe metformin can alleviate some of the negative effects that oxandrolone has on the reproductive system of rats. Um, still, when you look at metformin as a whole, again, in particular medical situation, metformin might be able to improve fertility parameters. But personally, I would stay away from metformin because IGF-1 also has a beneficial effect on male fertility. But we'll save that discussion for the ancillaries versus fertility video and the peptides versus fertility video, which are coming soon. All right, so moving over to anadrol. Anadrol actually inhibits progesterone synthesis in the ovaries as well as in the placenta and was examined as a medication to induce abortions during early stages of pregnancy. However, pregnancy terminations weren't always accomplished in both human subjects and animal models. So now that we know that oxymetolone anadrol actually inhibits progesterone synthesis in females and potentially in men as well, maybe that combination of oxymetolone with stenazol, which I mentioned a couple of years prior, isn't that far-fetched. You have a compound that inhibits progesterone synthesis and a compound that inhibits progesterone receptor binding potentially. Now, of course, oxymetolone, just like all the other anabolic androgenic steroids, would completely shut down your HPTA with prolonged exposure. So testosterone synthesis is impaired, estrogen synthesis is impaired, as well as progesterone synthesis within testicles and uh, adrenal function regarding DHA, DHA sulfate, pregnenolone, pregnenolone sulfate. Production is also impaired, but not completely shut down. Still, I think this warrants a little bit more literature review. Let me know down below in the comment section if you would like to see it. Moving over to the four animal studies showing a neutral outcome, which are very similar to the Nandrolone plus antioxidant supplement animal studies. Co-administration of white top leaf extract, Caucasian wortel berry extract, watercress extract, and royal jelly supplementation significantly alleviated oxymetolone induced pathological alterations, testicular dysfunction, the worsening of fertility parameters, and even DNA fragmentation within the spermatosa, all shown in various male rat and mice models. So this means that these supplements actually mitigate oxymetolone-induced oxidative stress within the reproductive organs. And for the guys who don't know, royal jelly is a substance that the honeybees secrete for their larvae as well as their queen. Apparently, it's highly nutritious, full with antioxidants, similar to manuka honey, also coming from bees. Manuka honey has actually been investigated regarding improvement of fertility parameters in both males and females, and it was shown to do so. So maybe you should combine royal jelly with manuka honey when you're going on oxymetolone, but royal jelly and manuka honey should not be mistaken for Camagra oral jelly, which is something different entirely. But Camagra oral jelly might also be good for fertility and pregnancy outcomes. If you know, you know. And both animal studies showing a negative outcome after oxymetolone treatment are very similar results to all of the other animal studies with a negative outcome. Various levels of impaired semen parameters and also deleterious effects on the reproductive organs. Let's move over to Trestolone, MENT, which was actually investigated as a potential male anticontraceptive, but further development was abandoned after clinical trials showed that Trestolone wasn't capable to induce complete azospermia in all male human subjects. Now, Tristolone, like mebolarone or metribolone, is also used to assess androgen receptor presence, content, and binding potential in various tissues, and to assess the response in animal reproductive organs. But yet again, without tracking actual changes in overall semen parameters. Luckily, we have a lot of human studies to pull data from. All negative results, all negative outcomes. All of these human studies showed a significant reduction of semen parameters after 9 to 11 months of Trestolone implant treatments. So in all of these studies, Trestolone meant was never administered intramuscularly or subcutaneously. They always administered implants, which were approximately 135 to 140 milligrams meant per implant. Sometimes men would get one implant, two, sometimes even four implants over a multitude of weeks. Occasionally, this was combined with etonogestrol, which is a progestin-based anti-contraceptive for women. So now you got a negative effect 
on your testicles through the progesterone receptor from men, and again, a negative effect through the progesterone receptor from etonogestrel, right? Two progestin-based anticontraceptives in an attempt to achieve complete full azospermia. However, infertility wasn't always accomplished and overall semen parameters were returned to baseline within 16 weeks of trestolone discontinuation. So when you compare these results to the Nandrol and Decanoate studies in combination with medroxyprogesterone acetate, with Nandrol and Decanoate treatment, you would need approximately 17 months for fertility parameters to come back somewhat to baseline levels. But with Trestolone, it only takes 16 weeks. So when it comes to fertility, Nandrolone is more deleterious than Trestolone. Keep that in mind, guys, going forward, making your drug selection in the future. But to be fair, most of the studies that I was able to find were actually review papers discussing various applications of Trestolone as a male anti-contraceptive, pulling data from various sources. There's only two studies which were actually performed on men regarding its application as an anti-contraceptive and tracking longitudinal data. And the reason why I included one of the studies that showed an improvement of fertility parameters after discontinuation is because that was only determined on HPTA function, so luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, testosterone, estrogen levels, they all returned to baseline levels. However, semen was not further investigated after 16 weeks of discontinuation. So even though HPTA function recovered, we don't know if semen parameters recovered also. We can assume so, but again, this study didn't show it, so I included it in the negative results. And in both animal studies showing a neutral outcome, azospermia wasn't sustained during trestolone implant treatment following luteinizing hormone receptor hormone antagonist or agonist induced complete azospermia. So it doesn't matter how hard you hit the LHRH receptor, whether that's an agonist or an antagonist, azospermia is still accomplished. Now, after this agonist or antagonist was discontinued, but they continued with tristolone implant treatments, fertility parameters recovered somewhat, but not to fertile levels. So clinically, these animals were still subfertile, but the fertility parameters did recover to baseline levels, so normal fertility levels within 16 months, again, similar to the nandrolone treatments, 16 months after discontinuation. So these are neutral results, I would say. And then there's two animal studies showing a negative outcome with various levels of impaired fertility during trestolone treatments. Let's go to Trembolone. Everybody's favorite, the Trembolone sandwich. Let me know down below in the comment section if you use the timestamps to skip ahead to the Trembolone because I'm 100% sure that many of you did. Most of the studies were performed in the context of improving feed efficiency and growth of various livestock animals. There are a surprising number of studies about Tremblo with regards to sexual differentiation and sexual maturation in animal models, where Tremblo alters the development of the reproductive organs during adolescence and puberty phases. Semen parameters were rarely investigated in these studies, but, 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 but there are instances where female animals formed an ova testes where spermatosa were found in the ovaries. Doesn't sound good. So don't take Trembolone during puberty, especially if you're a female. You might develop some gonads and actually start producing some semen. So be clear of Trembolone when you're still undergoing puberty, please. And it is of note that there's actually several studies out there that explore the health concerns about using anabolic steroids as growth promoters in livestock, because some speculate that these anabolic energetic steroid treated animals, the consumption of their meat, might have a negative effect on the reproductive function, but this wasn't investigated in human subjects. But we do know that human subjects, especially athletes, might fail the doping test for trembolone metabolites after consuming a lot of tainted meat. Or maybe they use this as an excuse and they found some tainted meat containing trembolone metabolites, but actually they were on a boatload of trembolone themselves. Maybe this is the secret reason behind the carnivore diet or even the vertical diet containing a lot of beef. Maybe you get enough trembolone metabolites in your diet for anabolism to occur. Probably also deleterious effects on your reproductive health. Never mind. Moving over. Oh, and before I forget, during my research about trembolone regarding its effect on overall fertility parameters, I came across a compound called Ultrenogest, which is a 17 alpha allylated, not alkylated, 17 alpha allylated derivative of trembolone, also known as allyl trembolone 
or allyl trienolol. I mean, who comes up with these names? That's a mouthful, a terrible tongue twister, allyl trienolol. Man. It's uh, widely used as a veterinary medication to suppress or synchronize estrus in horses and pigs. All studies on L. Trenogest show severely impaired fertility parameters. Since our community doesn't use L. Trenogest, I didn't investigate or didn't include this compound any further for the scope of this video. So let's just discuss the Trimbaloni sandwich instead. One human study showing a negative outcome. No surprise there which is a review paper about trimbalone and other anabolic antigenic steroids and their effect on the endocrine system and reproductive organs. So unfortunately, again, trimbalone hasn't been investigated regarding fertility parameters individually. This is a review paper. I couldn't find the full publication, so I couldn't go through the references to find the papers that I actually review in the context of that study. Maybe in the future we'll get that study and we can review it together for a follow-up video. And I used Trimbalone, Trienolone, Parabolone, Hexabolone, Finajet, and Finaplex to find human subject studies. I couldn't find any of them with full publications. But hold your cattle, not horses. Horses use Boldenone and cattle use Trimbalone. There's five animal studies showing a neutral outcome, but all of these animal studies were performed on fish, on mosquito fish, on zebra fish, Japanese medaka fish, and sheephead minnow fish. And all of those fish seem to be immune to Trimbalone's potential negative effect on fertility parameters. There's no histological changes or reduction of semen parameters as a whole. They barely change. So maybe Trimbalone is most certainly bull shark approved. Still, there are four animal studies showing a negative outcome. All of them are on terrestrial animals. So the fish are apparently immune, but the terrestrial animals clear deleterious effects after Trimbalone treatment. Of these animal studies performed on livestock, there are clear histopathological abnormalities or complete degeneration of the reproductive organs. Those are the testes, the ovaries, and the uteri. Significant reduction of sex hormone serum concentrations, impaired spermatogenesis in bulls, calves, and lambs, and pigs consuming a diet containing trace amounts of Trimbalone acetate observed similar negative effects. So whether you get Finajet or Finaplex implants or eat Trimbalone tainted foods, the results are pretty much the same across the board, or at least in animal models. And then the last steroid I want to discuss in this video, oh, let's not forget Stembalone, but unfortunately there's no studies performed on Stembalone regarding fertility parameters. So let's move over to Stenazolol, Winstrol, Stromba, one human study, a case report showing a negative outcome which is where an elite bodybuilder self-administered testosterone, nandrolone, and Winstrol for over one year, and he observed complete azospermia, testicular atrophy, impaired each PTA function, and unfortunately, yet again, there's not a single study out there where stenazolol was investigated in human subjects individually. So let's have a look at the animal studies. One is neutral, which is very similar to the oxymetolone plus antioxidant supplement animal study results. This single neutral animal study showed that co-administration of royal jelly supplementation significantly alleviated stenazol induced subfertility in male mice. So they weren't completely azospermic, but they were subfertile. And royal jelly was able to alleviate that to a certain extent. DNA damage of the spermatosa was also significantly reduced. Royal jelly supplementation mitigates stenazol induced oxidative stress in the reproductive organs. Again, it's linked down below if you want to read it for yourself. And then there are nine animal studies showing negative results where semen parameters go down, changes in the reproductive organs, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so after all of that, what have we learned? Anabolic androgenic steroids are deleterious for your fertility unless you stick with halotestin or proviron. And even then, I think now the medical community has a much better range of solutions to improve fertility parameters in the form of HCG, HMG, recombinant luteinizing hormone, recombinant follicle stimulating hormone, clomiphene citrate, or enclomiphene citrate. I would rather look into those options than ever, ever, ever consider to use halotestin as a fertility aid or proviron. 
as a fertility aid. I would stay clear at all costs because the updated inserts show that both halotestin and provirin are not recommended, probably because the manufacturers don't want to get sued, right? Because all the information is not really um, representative of what is currently accepted by the medical community. Now, the 90 nor testosterone derivatives that have um, effects on the progesterone receptor in the testicle specifically, and even in the uh, pituitary specifically, those are no bueno. So, trestolone, trembolone, nandrolone, all deleterious effects on your overall fertility parameters. Now, it doesn't mean that fertility parameters can't come back to baseline levels within several months of discontinuation. But still, if you're thinking about conceiving in the near future, and maybe this was my mistake going on, what was it, a maximum of 100 milligrams nandrolone decanoate on my previous cycle, which might take up to 17 months for my fertility parameters to come back to baseline. But I unfortunately don't know what my fertility parameters were at baseline because I never did them before I ever took anabolic androgenic steroids. So that's my bad. Let's see what happens over the next couple of months. And it's very important to note that both enclomiphene and human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, are able to sustain fertility parameters over subfertile levels, so over what has been established by the World Health Organization in 2010 and updated in 2021. If you're on enclomiphene and HCG, at least in the context of TRT or various low-dose cycles, not containing 19 or testosterone derivatives like trembolone, nandrolone, and trestolone, in those instances, fertility is somewhat sustained. So, for the guys that are questioning if you can use enclomiphene or HCG during TRT, then for now the answer is yes, but those fertility parameters are not anywhere close to baseline readings before exogenous testosterone replacement therapy treatment. So fertility parameters go down, but they're still above the recommended or desired semen parameters established by the World Health Organization. Stay tuned for that video. There's a lot more scientific evidence to sift through. We've also learned that antioxidants like royal jelly, artichoke extract, vitamin C, melatonin, and some of the other extracts, white top leaf extract, Caucasian wortle berry extract, and watercress extract, might be able to mitigate some of the deleterious effects that steroids have on the reproductive organs, or at least in the context of reactive oxygen species. Now again, vitamin C has been investigated in the context of reactive oxygen species in the liver and in the kidneys when treated with boldenone and destinate. But the more research that I'm doing and the longer I spend on PubMed, the more scientific evidence come to the forefront that antioxidants are the key, <laughs> the absolute 100% key to keeping yourself healthy. So whether that's vitamin C or some sort of extract or melatonin or royal jelly, pretty much mandatory to run when you're using performance enhancing drugs, especially anabolic androgenic steroids that are known to increase reactive oxygen species. And whether that's beneficial effects on the reproductive organs, the kidneys, the liver, the brain. I mean, melatonin is a very potent antioxidant in the brain. I mean, crazy research regarding melatonin's beneficial effect or as an antioxidant in the brain. So and if you can run a reasonably high dose, let's say 3 to 10 milligrams, which was basically the highest dose I could tolerate when I went up to 30 milligrams of melatonin per day, I felt clinically depressed. Um, still, up until those dosages, a lot of scientific evidence show that melatonin is the goat of all antioxidants. Now, do we as a community deserve a proper study, besides all of these studies that I just investigated, a proper study showing the beneficial effects of various antioxidants on the reproductive organs of both male and females when they're using a combination of anabolic androgenic steroids? Yes, please, not animal models, human subjects. I would be willing to subject myself to that study um, if it was ever going to take place after I've had kids, right? After I have kids, I'll probably go back on cycle using various antioxidants to protect these nuts from oxidative stress. I would participate in that study and follow it all the way to the end because I want to know a higher truth on this subject. But I don't think it's ever going to happen considering the current affair of uh, the current state of Congress in various countries and their stance on anabolic energetic steroids. I mean, imagine if that study proved that antioxidant co-administration can prevent all kinds of deleterious effects in your organs. 
And then that would kind of justify for us to use testosterone replacement therapy or maybe even a little bit more. Again, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Nobody is going to fund that study, but we can all cross our fingers that it will happen within our lifetime. I'll leave it here, guys. Stay tuned for the upcoming TRT versus fertility video. I have a ton of scientific evidence to review. And once I'm done with that, that video will drop. For now, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Head over to Merrick Health if you're worried about your fertility and you need a patient care coordinator to look at your blood work parameters and tell you exactly how to get your reproductive health and organs back on track for conception and pregnancy in the future. Right, and otherwise send your blood work to me. I'll happily interpret it for you and discuss a fertility protocol with you so you can get your partner pregnant just like I'm planning to get my partner pregnant in the near future. You can find all of my sponsors and affiliates down below in the YouTube description section. Head over to my website, vigorousteve.com. I got a ton more affiliates there. Also a ton of free articles for your reading pleasure. Bookmark that site. Man, there's so many articles there that I haven't even made videos about. If you didn't bookmark it yet, you should be embarrassed. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at vigorousteve. A semi-anabolic frontal bicep for you guys. HCG and HMG monotherapy soon to be replaced with recombinant follicle stimulating hormone. Maybe then my fertility parameters will be supercharged. But let's see. Time will tell. As always, I will document my semen parameters online for the world to see. I mean, who does that? Oh, yeah, I do that. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next fertility video.